Okay, so we're going to continue on with our form finding case studies. Uh, today I wanted to take a look at the British Museum by Foster and Partners, the great court at the British Museum, the, the huge glass uh, grid shell canopy over the courtyard of the original museum. Uh, you may be familiar with the project from some of your structures courses maybe or even construction tech, um, but you can see this kind of undulating, billowing, if you will, glass surface uh, of more or less equilateral triangles uh, across the way. Uh, just a few more images of that. Uh, let's see if I can find them. Yep. So you can see the inside here. It gives you a sense of scale and 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 the kind of the elegance of this structure is shown from within, especially looking up at it and how uh, natural, if you will, the curvature is. And so this, um, well, I'll show you that in a second. Uh, so this was a project uh, by Foster and Partners, of course, but um, uh, an important figure in this project is uh, Dr. Chris Williams um, from the University of Bath, who created the, the mathematical or form finding process uh, in order to uh, compute the form and create its structural logic. And uh, he, he put together a pretty interesting um, piece of software for this that you can download from his website that I just showed. Um, and it shows uh, the process, what's called dynamic relaxation. Let's go ahead and start that. So the, let's go back to the fresh start. So originally these points are going to find them themselves a place around the perimeter and these points around the circle. The mesh faces in between are going to be able to um, act as though they're springs. And the relationship between the two points at the at start and end of either of those springs is going to determine uh, how the thing relaxes into its final form relative to some force that's being applied from underneath in order to create that structural billowing, as I called it earlier. Some of these topics that I'm talking about, it, some of it uh, we've already done in some of the uh, examples that we went over in the last couple of weeks. Um, but this is a, a very important a case study to understand um, the importance, I think, of these kinds of methods uh, of modeling in order to make them very, very beautiful, but also buildable. So you can get a sense of it here. And if we look at it from this view, you can see that kind of undulation or that billowing that um, we looked at when we looked at the, the photographs. And I can change its height using this, this software as a form finding tool to get a sense for where we s how, it's, how it's coming out. So we're gonna try to do something like this in Kangaroo. Um, for today's experiment, we won't be able to perfectly achieve these kind of near equilateral triangles. Um, maybe in the following week, um, I could show a way to, to, to model this mesh pro appropriately, but we're going to apply a similar kind of force, a similar set of forces, in fact, the same set of forces uh, through our mesh that we'll model in Rhino as we can see here. Okay, so there's a, a bit of an introduction to what we're looking at today. Okay, so I'm just going to close out of that. So we're going to get started in Rhino, and we're going to start this thing up from, uh, from scratch. Okay, so I'm going to draw a rectangle and f put in the first corner anywhere over here. And I'm going to draw it out to, uh, let's say, about 50 units in that direction and 35 in the other. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Uh, once again, didn't work. Sorry about that. Something doesn't look right about that. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, so 35 by 50. I, uh, was expecting a slightly different proportion, but that's that's going to be fine. And then we're going to um, then what I'll do is uh, I'm going to find the center point of this. I think I should be able to use my O snap at the bottom there. Yeah. So if I turn on my center at the O snap here, I could uh, find the center. And then I'm going to draw a circle from that center uh, of a diameter of 21 units, like that. 
And these are just some of the, I don't know if these re replicate the exact dimensions uh, or at least the proportions of the great chord. I just think it's pretty close. All right. And we can stay in our top view, as a matter of fact, for this. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is start preparing my base mesh for simulation. And um, so what we can do here is kind of split this thing into quadrants. And uh, that'll all become clear once we get to the point of simulation. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw. You know, I'm going to grab, fire up a different layer and start drawing some construction lines out like this. And, uh, and then we're going to run the split command. And we're going to split that circle using these as our cutting objects. And that's going to give us a set of four arcs like this. And we're going we're gonna to then take this rectangle and explode it. Okay, so explode that into four chunks like this. Okay, next uh, we can, I think we can get rid of these construction lines. You're welcome to keep them. I'm just going to hide them for now so I don't uh, run into them later. Um, I'm going to go to my layer five and I'm going to select corresponding arcs and lines like this, you know, one or one set at a time. And then I'm going to divide them each three times like this resulting in a few new points that we can now see on the screen here. And I'm going to do that for just two sides, like that. And then um, I can head back to my default layer, I guess. And um, what I'm going to do is use these points to draw surfaces, um, quadrilateral surfaces, so four-sided four um, surfaces. So I'm going to go to surface, corner points, and I'll just start over here and start snapping to these points like this. And I guess I can get a ghosted to show you those. All right. So, and I'm going to turn center off down on my L snap because that gets confusing sometimes. It gets snappy. Like that. And now, once we have that one set done, we can mirror those around so we don't have to remodel them. So then you can go ahead and do the same thing for the other side over here. So. Surface, corner points, click four points, and just draw those out like that. And then we can take those that we just drew, those three, and mirror those around the center point as before. And what we've done is we've basically just created a low resolution approximation of the, the roof scape that we're going to simulate into the shape that you saw earlier. Um, when I pulled up the example online. Okay. And then before we forget, I'm just going to turn that, um, I'm going to turn off those, those surfaces that we just drew. I'm just going to hide those surfaces for a second. Because this will be a little tricky later if we have to so what I'll do is just hide those surfaces and then select the, the two inner and outer curves, the circle and the rectangle, and just join those back together. So this is not 100% necessary, but it'll be helpful later, just to make our lives a little easier. Um, you know, and just to stay organized, what I'll do is I'll take those curves and I'll put them on a different layer. So I'm going to throw them on the uh, layer 5 just so I can see them pretty easily later. Okay, so the result of all this is a bunch of surfaces that look like this, that approximate the curvature on the middle, and they reach the edge, and um, also the outer rectangle as a joined polyline, and the circle as a joined polyline, once again. Okay, so the next step then is to start the process of uh, bringing this stuff into Grasshopper for, um, for simulation. So. Kind of like what we were doing before, um, but slightly different. It introduces a different, slightly different process. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll bring these in as surfaces. So I'll go ahead and grab a surface um, parameter. Right click on that and select multiple. And we're going to set those surfaces that we just drew in whatever order. 
like that. And we're going to pop those in. Uh, and now you can go ahead and turn off that layer if you like, because we don't really need to see that for the rest of the, unless we have to make an edit or something, we really don't need to see it. Okay, so we're going to convert those surfaces into meshes. So we're going to go to mesh, simple mesh. And each time I put another component in, I'm going to turn the previous preview off. Okay, otherwise you're going to end up with a lot of overlap in this next step. So every time I include something, turn off the former preview. And then I'm going to go to kangaroo and go to mesh and combine and clean. That's the little broom component. That's going to kind of clean up our mesh for us a little bit. And then we need to make some, we need to add some resolution to this. Uh, we need some structure in here, right? So we need to add some faces. So let's add a refine component. So that's kangaroo mesh and refine. And let's give that a level of three. A level of one is not quite enough. So let's drop that in like that. So I just grabbed a panel and I input a, a, a level of three into that. And as you can see now, I've got many more faces to work with, which will end up being eventually the edges of our structural grid. Um, one thing that I'm going to do as well, um, which may or may not be necessary as you guys work, um, but I'm going to do it just in case because I, in testing this, I realized this was important. I need to uh, just go to kangaroo mesh and then mesh turn. And I need to uh, make sure that all our meshes are in the same general direction so that they're all in the same uh, order. Otherwise, our edges might get a little messed up in, in one of the steps coming up. And then the last step is to stay in kangaroo, go over to mesh once again, and click on di diagonalize and drop in the diagonalize component, which looks like this. So what that does is it converts our our mesh from being a kind of, let's say, a standard grid to a diag to a diagrid. Okay. Okay. So let's get some of the more tedious stuff out of the way. So I'm going to go over to mesh and grab this uh, analysis component called mesh edges. And that's going to separate out our inner meshes from our outer meshes. So our lines, I should say. So if I, you don't have to do this, I just want to show you. So this one here out of E1 is going to output all of our edges on the outside. Uh, let's say all the naked edges. And any edge that faces, that touches air on one side will be a naked edge. So it'll separate those from the interiors, which would be helpful, um, especially since we're going to need to basically break these lines back down again so that there's a vertice or a point at every single one of these intersections in our diagrid along that line, which we didn't model before because um, we really had no way of knowing where those points would be until we subdivided the mesh. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. And you, you don't have to preview this. You can leave that off. Um, so what I'm going to do then is uh, join these curves. You can go to Curve, Join, and that's going to come out of E1. And then I'm going to measure their lengths from analysis. And then I'm going to sort these, the length of these two overall polylines um, to distinguish between the two of them. So the shorter one will be the circle, and the longer one will be the rectangle. So go ahead and over to set, list, and sort. The thing that we're, the stuff we're sorting is actually the numerical information. So that's the lengths. Those are all the numbers. And relative to that is our, our, two, our two lines, our two polylines. And coming out of the A output will be our two curves now in order. So the first one in line will be the shortest one, and the second one will be the longer one. Um, go to list, list item. And now we can separate these by zooming in like that. And um, I now have an output I and plus one, and that's my two curves. So this is my circle, and this is my rectangle. OK, uh, now what I'm going to do is break those back apart again by exploding them. So you can go to Curve. Now that I've got them separated, I can explode these. So let's explode. And what's cool now is that I'm seeing all the little vertices in between. Right, because we derived all these little mesh edges as separate lines, j forced them to join back into a, a continuous polyline, figured out which one was which, and now we can break it back down again. And do that for both. Okay, so 
explode both. And you can turn off that preview. Uh, remember, if you're not turning off previews as we work toward the end of this, you're going to end up with a lot of stuff on screen that will make very little sense. OK. And now I can go to vector. Oops, never mind. Curve. And we're going to just gather up the endpoints. Start an endpoints for each one of these like this. I can turn off that preview. And now I'm going to um, go up over to Kangaroo and start setting my first set of goals here. And basically what we're going to do is going to force all of these vertices in here, the ones that we just drew there, to coincide with that circle. And similarly, we're going to take all these vertices out here and make it, to co uh, make it coincide with these outer, this outer rectangle. But we're not going to set their positions as anchors. We're going to let them slide back and forth. And that will help the relaxation, as you saw in this to do something similar to that, OK? So go to Kangaroo and head over to Goals On. And On Curve is the one we want. And we can drop two of those in since we're going to need them. Um, the points is going to be the, the output of S. So that's the, all the start points. And the strength, um, we're going to have to crank up to something much higher. So let's drop in a panel and make that. Uh, 1,000. And the curves that we're going to associate these two are the two are the two curves um, that you know we, we drew earlier. But it's not going to be these polyline curves. It's going to be the original ones that we drew in Rhino back over here. Okay. Um, so go ahead and over to parameters and grab that curve parameter. And then set one curve, first being the circle. That circle is now in. We're going to associate it with those set of points, right? And do that again, except this time selecting the rectangle and associating that with the points along the rectangle, like this. OK, so hopefully that's all clear for now. OK, now to get rolling on this, we just need a few more goals. So before I do that, I'm going to head over to Kangaroo. And this is, you know, kind of similar to what we did before. We're going to jump ahead a little bit, grab our solver. Uh, I'm not going to use bouncy in this case. I'm just going to use the solver. And um, I'm going to grab a button and a Boolean toggle like we did in the last couple of weeks. So you should be sort of familiar with this. It's kind of um, getting routine now. OK, before I set any goals, I'm going to do a little bit more work over here. And um, I'm going to head back in space and uh, and make sure that I've got some forces going through these lines. OK, so I'm going to go to Kangaroo again and head over to Goals Line and grab the length component that we're, we're using for basically every, every script here. And then I'm going to drop in both the E1 and, e in and E2 inputs into this. OK, and to do that again, you hold Shift as you carry the second one in, and it'll, ca it'll, it'll carry forward. All right, so E1, E2, both go into line. Um, the length on this is going to need to be zero. We want to get as close as to a minimal surface as possible. So we're going to put in zero there. And the strength on this should be very low. Um, so I'm going to drop in 0 0.1 in this case. Because I, I want those curves to be able to kind of change uh, their length as necessary in order to get the, the, f the form to be uh, as smooth as possible. OK, so there's another uh, goal set that I just now created. We'll let that hang for a bit. Um, let's start. Let's keep going. So we're going to go to Kangaroo, Kangaroo Main, grab the show, the light bulb. And um, that's going to be our mesh. So from our mesh, we're going to go ahead and grab the light bulb. And then we just need uh, some anchors. And we should be ready to go after that. And a quick way of doing that is to just head into mesh, um, you know, the mesh tab in Kangaroo, grab this thing called mesh corners, and uh, go ahead and plug the mesh into that like this. And that'll give us the four corners of our mesh, which are the only things actually that we need to anchor. The rest of it, the rest of the points, are going to be taken care of over here. And then um, wrap it up by going to goals point, anchor, 
and dropping in that. And the strength on this uh, should already be by default huge, so we should leave that alone. Okay, so we're pretty good to go here, uh, as far as I can tell. So let's start dropping in our goals. Um, start with the anchor. I guess the order in this case may not matter. And then I'll put in these. And I'm going to go ahead and drop this in. And then our mesh last. I'm going to turn off the solver because there's still quite a bit uh, coming out of that. Uh, and then in Rhino, I'm going to select everything and hide it. Not delete it, but hide it. And see what I got coming out here. So I have, um, yeah, so I've got, it uh, looks like the mesh is right ahead and in, in, in at the first output there. Um, so I'm going to keep this thing off. And I'm going to flatten this output by right clicking on that O there and just hit flatten. And then um, over in list, grab your list item again. And the first thing coming out of there should be our, our mesh. And we can go ahead and back in space and turn off the mesh that we used, you know, to set all this up. So make sure you're doing that because if this is still previewing, uh, again, you're going to have uh, quite a bit on screen that's going to be harder to tell what's happening. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and turn this on. And you can see what happened there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my top view to show you that a little more carefully. Zoom in on this area. And I'm going to just slightly minimize Grasshopper for a second. I'm going to reset. So you can see our original condition here. Uh, this is kind of a, our original mesh. And you can see our, our low res polygonal opening on the inside. And when I, when I reset that, uh, all those points are going to be drawn to its boundary, so the circle. And then you can see the dynamic relaxation taking place. So the curves are now relaxing into a more natural condition based on the, the outer boundaries, the inner boundary, and the forces that you're applying to those lines, which in this case are attempting to be um, minimized in terms of their length, which means they're being stretched. And the result of that is a kind of a more optimal, let's say, um, structural uh, uh, grid that's finding its way um, between those boundary conditions, like I said before. So the, the rectangle as it was in the original museum and the center part um, as well. So I'll just click that a few more times so you can watch it play out. Any questions at all about this, just raise your hand. I mean, you, you may not have the same output that I do. And if this part over here especially didn't work, just let us know and we'll, we'll fix it for you. Okay, and then the next thing is going to be to add some force to this. So I'm going to go to my perspective view again. And you can see that we're, all st we're still flat, uh, of course, because we haven't yet. And, you know, just for the sake of clarity on screen, too, I'm going to uh, turn off those points, you know. Now we can see it a little bit better. That's nice. Okay, so we just got to uh, add force to this in order to get it into a structural, um, a structural dome. And to do that... I'm going to go with the um, so kangaroo, Cole's line, and dynamic weight method. Um, if you don't have this component installed, uh, I'll show you another version. But I'm going to hope that you have this installed. Uh, I can't remember which version this came with. I think it's with the new Rhino 6 version. Those of you in Rhino 5, um, I'll show you an option in just a second. So just hang tight. Um, OK, so dynamic weight. Uh, you know, actually, Rhino 5 might have this, too. So, um, But anyway, I'll show another option just in case there's anyone out there that that is missing this. Um, what we need is some lines to apply this to, and we could use these again, um, but, you know, just to kind of get you into the habit of knowing that there's multiple ways of doing things, I'm going to go to Weaver Bird, Extract, Mesh Edges, and this is another way of, of extracting edges from a mesh. And I'm going to just plug those into the line input there, like so. And then before I plug this thing in, I need to make sure that this W input is quite low. And that's, um, that's important for this example. So I'm going to grab a slider, right click it, head on into edit, make its maximum value 0 0.001. Uh, no, sorry, 0 0.01. So its maximum value is anywhere between 0 and 0 0.01. 
Uh, I'm going to drop it down to 0 0.007, 007, and plug that into W. And then I'm going to add this by holding shift, the output of that, by holding shift and add that to my goals. And, you know, because we've got the quick solver on, uh, this is going to converge really, really quickly. So we found our, our optimal form finding solution um, just by adding some weight, if you will, um, to each one of those lines, some dynamic weight. And you can play with that uh, slider so long as it's controlled between the two, you know, between the boundaries that I told you, 0 0.01. And you can go ahead and play with that a little bit. And if we crank it up to 0 0.01, you can see that it's kind of high. Um, you can experiment with this. I guess you can go a little further if you like, like 0 0.02, you know. But really, the thing is, is that any higher than this, and we're getting outside of the realm of the British, um, the actual museum itself, the Great Court. So, but the form on this is quite similar, actually. I'd say to, to what we saw in the photographs and also in the form finding um, software that we downloaded from Dr. Williams' website.